Section 7 of the Fireside Chats of Franklin Delano Roosevelt. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Fireside Chats of Franklin Delano Roosevelt by Franklin D. Roosevelt. Section 7. April 28, 1935 since my annual message to the congress on january fourth last i have not addressed the general public over the air in the many weeks since that time the congress has devoted itself to the arduous task of formulating legislation necessary to the country's welfare it has made and is making distinct progress before i come to any of the specific measures however I want to leave in your minds one clear fact. The administration and the Congress are not proceeding in any haphazard fashion in this task of government. Each of our steps has a definite relationship to every other step. The job of creating a program for the nation's welfare is, in some respects, like the building of a ship. At different points on the coast where I often visit, they build great sea-going ships. When one of these ships is under construction and the steel frames have been set in the keel, it is difficult for a person who does not know ships to tell how it will finally look when it is sailing the high seas. It may seem confused to some, but out of the multitude of detailed parts that go into the making of the structure, the creation of a useful instrument for man ultimately comes. It is that way with the making of a national policy. The objective of the nation has greatly changed in three years. Before that time, individual self-interest and group selfishness were paramount in public thinking. The general good was at a discount. Three years of hard thinking have changed the picture. More and more people, because of clearer thinking and a better understanding, are considering the whole rather than a mere part relating to one section or to one crop or to one industry or to an individual private occupation. That is a tremendous gain for the principles of democracy the overwhelming majority of people in this country know how to sift the wheat from the chaff in what they hear and what they read they know that the process of the constructive rebuilding of america cannot be done in a day or a year but that it is being done in spite of the few who seek to confuse them and to profit by their confusion americans as a whole are feeling a lot better a lot more cheerful than for many many years the most difficult place in the world to get a clear open perspective of the country as a whole is washington i am reminded sometimes of what president wilson once said so many people come to washington who know things that are not so and so few people who know anything about what the people of the united states are thinking about that is why I occasionally leave this scene of action for a few days to go fishing or back home to Hyde Park, so that I can have a chance to think quietly about the country as a whole. To get away from the trees, as they say, and to look at the whole forest. This duty of seeing the country in a long-range perspective is one which, in a very special manner, attaches to this office to which you have chosen me. Did you ever stop to think that there are, after all, only two positions in the nation that are filled by the vote of all the voters, the president and the vice-president? That makes it particularly necessary for the vice-president and for me to conceive of our duty toward the entire country. I speak, therefore, tonight to and of the American people as a whole my most immediate concern is in carrying out the purposes of the great work program just enacted by the congress 
its first objective is to put men and women now on the relief rolls to work and incidentally to assist materially in our already unmistakable march toward recovery i shall not confuse my discussion by a multitude of figures so many figures are quoted to prove so many things sometimes it depends upon what paper you read and what broadcast you hear therefore let us keep our minds on two or three simple essential facts in connection with this problem of unemployment it is true that while business and industry are definitely better our relief rolls are still too large however for the first time in five years the relief rolls have declined instead of increased during the winter months they are still declining the simple fact is that many million more people have private work today than two years ago today or one year ago today and every day that passes offers more chances to work for those who want to work in spite of the fact that unemployment remains a serious problem here as in every other nation we have come to recognize the possibility and the necessity of certain helpful remedial measures these measures are of two kinds the first is to make provisions intended to relieve to minimize and to prevent future unemployment the second is to establish the practical means to help those who are unemployed in this present emergency our social security legislation is an attempt to answer the first of these questions our works relief program the second the program for social security now pending before the congress is a necessary part of the future unemployment policy of the government while our present and projected expenditures for work relief are wholly within the reasonable limits of our national credit resources it is obvious that we cannot continue to create governmental deficits for that purpose year after year we must begin now to make provision for the future that is why our social security program is an important part of the complete picture it proposes by means of old age pensions to help those who have reached the age of retirement to give up their jobs and thus give to the younger generation greater opportunities for work and to give to all a feeling of security as they look toward old age the unemployment insurance part of the legislation will not only help to guard the individual in future periods of layoff against dependence upon relief but it will by sustaining purchasing power cushion the shock of economic distress another helpful feature of unemployment insurance is the incentive it will give to employers to plan more carefully in order that unemployment may be prevented by the stabilizing of employment itself provisions for social security however are protections for the future our responsibility for the immediate necessities of the unemployed has been met by the congress through the most comprehensive work plan in the history of the nation our problem is to put to work three and one half million employable persons now on the relief rolls it is a problem quite as much for private industry as for the government we are losing no time getting the government's vast work relief program under way and we have every reason to believe that it should be in full swing by autumn in directing it i shall recognize six fundamental principles one the projects should be useful two projects shall be of a nature that a considerable portion of the money spent will go into wages for labor three projects will be sought which promise ultimate return to the federal treasury of a considerable proportion of the costs four funds allotted for each project should be actually and promptly spent and not held over until later years five 
in all cases projects must be of a character to give employment to those on the relief rolls six projects will be allocated to localities or relief areas in relation to the number of workers on relief rolls in those areas i next want to make it clear exactly how we shall direct the work one i have set up a division of applications and information to which all proposals for the expenditure of money must go for preliminary study and consideration two after the division of applications and information has sifted those projects they will be sent to an allotment division composed of representatives of the more important governmental agencies charged with carrying on work relief projects the group will also include representatives of cities and of labor farming banking and industry this allotment division will consider all of the recommendations submitted to it and such projects as they approve will be next submitted to the president who under the act is required to make final allocations three the next step will be to notify the proper government agency in whose field the project falls and also to notify another agency which i am creating a progress division this division will have the duty of coordinating the purchases of materials and supplies and of making certain that people who are employed will be taken from the relief rolls it will also have the responsibility of determining work payments in various localities of making full use of existing employment services and to assist people engaged in relief work to move as rapidly as possible back into private employment when such employment is available moreover this division will be charged with keeping projects moving on schedule four i have felt it to be essentially wise and prudent to avoid so far as possible the creation of new governmental machinery for supervising this work the national government now has at least sixty different agencies with the staff and the experience and the competence necessary to carry on the two hundred and fifty or three hundred kinds of work that will be undertaken these agencies therefore will simply be doing on a somewhat enlarged scale the same sort of things that they have been doing this will make certain that the largest possible portion of the funds allotted will be spent for actually creating new work and not for building up expensive overhead organizations here in washington for many months preparations have been under way the allotment of funds for desirable projects has already begun the key men for the major responsibilities of this great task already have been selected i well realize that the country is expecting before this year is out to see the dirt fly as they say in carrying on the work and i assure my fellow citizens that no energy will be spared in using these funds effectively to make a major attack upon the problem of unemployment our responsibility is to all of the people in this country this is a great national crusade to destroy enforced idleness which is an enemy of the human spirit generated by this depression our attack upon these enemies must be without stint and without discrimination no sectional no political distinctions can be permitted it must however be recognized that when an enterprise of this character is extended over more than three thousand counties throughout the nation there may be occasional instances of inefficiency bad management or misuse of funds when cases of this kind occur there will be those of course who will try to tell you that the exceptional failure is characteristic of the entire endeavor it should be remembered that in every big job there are some imperfections there are chiselers in every walk of life there are those in every industry who are guilty of unfair practices 
every profession has its black sheep but long experience in government has taught me that the exceptional instances of wrongdoing in government are probably less numerous than in almost every other line of endeavor the most effective means of preventing such evils in this works relief program will be the eternal vigilance of the american people themselves i call upon my fellow citizens everywhere to cooperate with me in making this the most efficient and the cleanest example of public enterprise the world has ever seen it is time to provide a smashing answer for those cynical men who say that a democracy cannot be honest and efficient if you will help this can be done i therefore hope you will watch the work in every corner of this nation feel free to criticize tell me of instances where work can be done better or where improper practices prevail neither you nor i want criticism conceived in a purely fault-finding or partisan spirit but i am jealous of the right of every citizen to call to the attention of his or her government examples of how the public money can be more effectively spent for the benefit of the american people i now come my friends to a part of the remaining business before the congress it has under consideration many measures which provide for the rounding out of the program of economic and social reconstruction with which we have been concerned for two years i can mention only a few of them tonight, but i do not want my mention of specific measures to be interpreted as lack of interest in or disapproval of many other important proposals that are pending the national industrial recovery act expires on the sixteenth of june after careful consideration i have asked the congress to extend the life of this useful agency of government as we have proceeded with the administration of this act we have found from time to time more and more useful ways of promoting its purposes no reasonable person wants to abandon our present gains we must continue to protect children to enforce minimum wages to prevent excessive hours to safeguard define and enforce collective bargaining and while retaining fair competition to eliminate so far as humanly possible the kinds of unfair practices by selfish minorities which unfortunately did more than anything else to bring about the recent collapse of industries there is likewise pending before the congress legislation to provide for the elimination of unnecessary holding companies in the public utility field i consider this legislation a positive recovery measure power production in this country is virtually back to the nineteen twenty nine peak the operating companies in the gas and electric utility field are by and large in good condition but under holding company domination the utility industry has long been hopelessly at war within itself and with public sentiment by far the greater part of the general decline in utility securities had occurred before i was inaugurated the absentee management of unnecessary holding company control has lost touch with and has lost the sympathy of the communities it pretends to serve even more significantly it has given the country as a whole an uneasy apprehension of over-concentrated economic power a business that loses the confidence of its customers and the good will of the public cannot long continue to be a good risk for the investor this legislation will serve the investor by ending the conditions which have caused that lack of confidence and good will it will put the public utility operating industry on a sound basis for the future both in its public relations and in its internal relations this legislation will not only in the long run 
result in providing lower electric and gas rates to the consumer but it will protect the actual value and earning power of properties now owned by thousands of investors who have little protection under the old laws against what used to be called frenzied finance it will not destroy values not only business recovery but the general economic recovery of the nation will be greatly stimulated by the enactment of legislation designed to improve the status of our transportation agencies there is need for legislation providing for the regulation of interstate transportation by buses and trucks for the regulation of transportation by water for the strengthening of our merchant marine and air transport for the strengthening of the interstate commerce commission to enable it to carry out a rounded conception of the national transportation system in which the benefits of private ownership are retained while the public stake in these important services is protected by the public's government finally the re-establishment of public confidence in the banks of the nation is one of the most hopeful results of our efforts as a nation to re-establish public confidence in private banking we all know that private banking actually exists by virtue of the permission of and regulation by the people as a whole speaking through their government wise public policy however requires not only that banking be safe but that its resources be most fully utilized in the economic life of the country to this end it was decided more than twenty years ago that the government should assume the responsibility of providing a means by which the credit of the nation might be controlled not by a few private banking institutions but by a body with public prestige and authority the answer to this demand was the federal reserve system twenty years of experience with this system have justified the efforts made to create it but these twenty years have shown by experience definite possibilities for improvement certain proposals made to amend the federal reserve act deserve prompt and favorable action by the congress they are a minimum of wise readjustments of our federal reserve system in the light of past experience and present needs these measures i have mentioned are in large part the program which under my constitutional duty i have recommended to the congress they are essential factors in a rounded program for national recovery they contemplate the enrichment of our national life by a sound and rational ordering of its various elements and wise provisions for the protection of the weak against the strong never since my inauguration in march nineteen thirty three have i felt so unmistakably the atmosphere of recovery but it is more than the recovery of the material basis of our individual lives it is the recovery of confidence in our democratic processes and institutions we have survived all of the arduous burdens and the threatening dangers of a great economic calamity we have in the darkest moments of our national trials retained our faith in our own ability to master our destiny fear is vanishing and confidence is growing on every side renewed faith in the vast possibilities of human beings to improve their material and spiritual status through the instrumentality of the democratic form of government that faith is receiving its just reward for that we can be thankful to the god who watches over america end of section seven recording by linda johnson Section 8 of The Fireside Chats of Franklin Delano Roosevelt. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Matt Perard. The Fireside Chats of Franklin Delano Roosevelt by Franklin D. Roosevelt. 
september sixth nineteen thirty six i have been on a journey of husbandry i went primarily to see at first hand conditions in the drought states to see how effectively federal and local authorities are taking care of pressing problems of relief and also how they are to work together to defend the people of this country against the effects of future droughts i saw drought devastation in nine states i talked with families who had lost their wheat crop lost their corn crop lost their livestock lost the water in their well lost their garden and come through to the end of the summer without one dollar of cash resources facing a winter without feed or food facing a planting season without seed to put in the ground that was the extreme case but there are thousands and thousands of families on western farms who share the same difficulties i saw cattlemen who because of lack of grass or lack of winter feed have been completely compelled to sell all but their breeding stock and will need help to carry even these through the coming winter i saw livestock kept alive only because water had been brought to them long distances in tank cars i saw other farm families who have not lost everything but who because they have made only partial crops must have some form of help if they are to continue farming next spring i shall never forget the fields of wheat so blasted by heat that they cannot be harvested i shall never forget field after field of corn stunted earless and stripped of leaves for what the sun left the grasshoppers took i saw brown pastures which would not keep a cow on fifty acres yet i would not have you think for a single minute that there is permanent disaster in these drought regions or that the picture i saw meant depopulating these areas no cracked earth no blistering sun no burning wind no grasshoppers are a permanent match for the indomitable american farmers and stockmen and their wives and children who have carried on through desperate days and inspire us with their self-reliance their tenacity and their courage it was their father's task to make homes it is their task to keep those homes it is our task to help them win their fight first let me talk for a minute about this autumn and the coming winter we have the option in the case of families who need actual substance of putting them on the dole or putting them to work they do not want to go on the dole and they are one thousand per cent right we agree therefore that we must put them to work for a decent wage and when we reach that decision we kill two birds with one stone because these families will earn enough by working not only to subsist themselves but to buy food for their stock and seed for next year's planting into this scheme of things there fit of course the government lending agencies which next year as in the past will help with production loans every governor with whom i have talked is in full accord with this program of doing work for these farm families just as every governor agrees that the individual states will take care of their unemployables but that the cost of employing those who are entirely able and willing to work must be borne by the federal government if then we know as we do today the approximate number of farm families who will require some form of work relief from now on through the winter we face the question of what kind of work they should do let me make it clear that this is not a new question because it has already been answered to a greater or less extent in every one of the drought communities beginning in nineteen thirty four when we also had serious drought conditions the state and federal governments cooperated in planning a large number of projects many of them directly aimed at the alleviation of future drought conditions in accordance with that program literally thousands of ponds or small reservoirs have been built in order to supply water for stock 
and to lift the level of the underground water to protect wells from going dry thousands of wells have been drilled or deepened community lakes have been created and irrigation projects are being pushed water conservation by means such as these is being expanded as a result of this new drought all through the great plains area the western corn belt and in the states that lie further south in the middle west water conservation is not so pressing a problem here the work projects run more to soil erosion control and the building of farm to market roads spending like this is not waste it would spell future waste if we did not spend for such things now these emergency work projects provide money to buy food and clothing for the winter they keep the livestock on the farm they provide seed for a new crop and best of all they will conserve soil and water in the future in those areas most frequently hit by drought if for example in some local area the water table continues to drop and the topsoil to blow away the land values will disappear with the water and the soil people on the farms will drift into the nearby cities the cities will have no farm trade and the workers in the city factories and stores will have no jobs property values in the cities will decline if on the other hand the farms within that area remain as farms with better water supply and no erosion the farm population will stay on the land and prosper and the nearby cities will prosper too property values will increase instead of disappearing that is why it is worth our while as a nation to spend money in order to save money i have used the argument in relation only to a small area it holds good in its effect on the nation as a whole every state in the drought area is now doing and always will do business with every state outside it the very existence of the men and women working in the clothing factories of new york making clothes worn by farmers and their families of the workers in the steel mills in pittsburgh and the automobile factories of detroit and in the harvester factories of illinois depend upon the farmers ability to purchase the commodities they produce in the same way it is the purchasing power of the workers in these factories in the cities that enables them and their wives and children to eat more beef more pork more wheat more corn more fruit and more dairy products and to buy more clothing made from cotton wool and leather in a physical and a property sense as well as in a spiritual sense we are members one of another i want to make it clear that no simple panacea can be applied to the drought problem in the whole of the drought area plans must depend on local conditions for these vary with annual rainfall soil characteristics altitude and topography water and soil conservation methods may differ in one county from those in an adjoining county work to be done in the cattle and sheep country differs in type from work in the wheat country or work in the corn belt the great plains drought area committee has given me its preliminary recommendations for a long-time program for that region using that report as a basis we are cooperating successfully and in entire accord with the governors and state planning boards as we get this program into operation the people more and more will be able to maintain themselves securely on the land that will mean a steady decline in the relief burdens which the federal government and states have had to assume in time of drought but more important it will mean a greater contribution to general national prosperity by these regions which have been hit by drought it will conserve and improve not only property values but human values the people in the drought area do not want to be dependent on federal state or any other kind of charity they want for themselves and their families an opportunity to share fairly by their own efforts in the progress of america the farmers of america want a sound national agricultural policy in which a permanent land use program will have an important place 
they want assurance against another year like nineteen thirty two when they made good crops but had to sell them for prices that meant ruin just as surely as did the drought sound policy must maintain farm prices in good crop years as well as in bad crop years it must function when we have drought it must also function when we have bumper crops the maintenance of a fair equilibrium between farm prices and the prices of industrial products is an aim which we must keep ever before us just as we must give constant thought to the sufficiency of the food supply of the nation even in bad years our modern civilization can and should devise a more successful means by which the excess supplies of bumper years can be conserved for use in lean years on my trip i have been deeply impressed with the general efficiency of those agencies of the federal state and local governments which have moved in on the immediate task created by the drought in nineteen thirty four none of us had preparation we worked without blueprints and made the mistakes of inexperience hindsight shows us this but as time has gone on we have been making fewer and fewer mistakes remember that the federal and state governments have done only broad planning actual work on a given project originates in the local community local needs are listed from local information local projects are decided on only after obtaining the recommendations and help of those in the local community who are best able to give it and it is worthy of note that on my entire trip though i asked the questions dozens of times i heard no complaint against the character of a single work relief project the elected heads of the states concerned together with their state officials and their experts from agricultural colleges and state planning boards have shown cooperation with and approval of the work which the federal government has headed i am grateful also to the men and women in all these states who have accepted leadership in the work in their locality in the drought area people are not afraid to use new methods to meet changes in nature and to correct mistakes of the past if overgrazing has injured rangelands they are willing to reduce the grazing if certain wheat lands should be returned to pasture they are willing to cooperate if trees should be planted as windbreaks or to stop erosion they will work with us if terracing or summer fallowing or crop rotation is called for they will carry them out they stand ready to fit and not to fight the ways of nature we are helping and shall continue to help the farmer to do those things through local soil conservation committees and other cooperative local state and federal agencies of government i have not the time tonight to deal with other and more comprehensive agricultural policies with this fine help we are tiding over the present emergency we are going to conserve soil conserve water and conserve life we are going to have long time defenses against both low prices and drought we are going to have a farm policy that will serve the national welfare that is our hope for the future there are two reasons why i want to end by talking about reemployment tomorrow is labor day the brave spirit with which so many millions of working people are winning their way out of depression deserves respect and admiration it is like the courage of the farmers in the drought areas that is my first reason the second is that healthy employment conditions stand equally with healthy agricultural conditions as a buttress of national prosperity dependable employment at fair wages is just as important to the people in the towns and cities as good farm income is to agriculture our people must have the ability to buy the goods they manufacture and the crops they produce thus city wages and farm buying power are the two strong legs that carry the nation forward reemployment in industry is proceeding rapidly 
government spending was in large part responsible for keeping industry going and putting it in a position to make this reemployment possible government orders were the backlog of heavy industry government wages turned over and over again to make consumer purchasing power and to sustain every merchant in the community businessmen with their businesses small and large had to be saved private enterprise is necessary to any nation which seeks to maintain the democratic form of government in their case just as certainly as in the case of drought-stricken farmers government spending has saved government having spent wisely to save it private industry begins to take workers off the rolls of the government relief program until this administration we had no free employment service except in a few states and cities because there was no unified employment service the worker forced to move as industry moved often traveled over the country wandering after jobs which seemed always to travel just a little faster than he did he was often victimized by fraudulent practices of employment clearing houses and the facts of employment opportunities were at the disposal neither of himself nor of the employer in 1933 the united states employment service was created a cooperative state and federal enterprise through which the federal government matches dollar for dollar the funds provided by the states for registering the occupations and skills of workers and for actually finding jobs for these registered workers in private industry the federal state cooperation has been splendid already employment services are operating in thirty-two states and the areas not covered by them are served by the federal government we have developed a nationwide service with seven hundred district offices and one thousand branch offices thus providing facilities through which labor can learn of jobs available and employers can find workers last spring i expressed the hope that employers would realize their deep responsibility to take men off the relief rolls and give them jobs in private enterprise subsequently i was told by many employers that they were not satisfied with the information available concerning the skill and experience of the workers on the relief rolls on august twenty fifth i allocated a relatively small sum to the employment service for the purpose of getting better and more recent information in regard to those now actively at work on wpa projects information as to their skills and previous occupations and to keep the records of such men and women up to date for maximum service in making them available to industry tonight i am announcing the allocation of two and a half million dollars more to enable the employment service to make an even more intensive search than it has yet been equipped to make to find opportunities in private employment for workers registered with it tonight i urge the workers to cooperate with and take full advantage of this intensification of the work of the employment service this does not mean that there will be any lessening of our efforts under our wpa and pwa and other work relief programs until all workers have decent jobs in private employment at decent wages we do not surrender our responsibility to the unemployed we have had ample proof that it is the will of the american people that those who represent them in national state and local government should continue as long as necessary to discharge that responsibility but it does mean that the government wants to use resource to get private work for those now employed on government work and thus to curtail to a minimum the government expenditures for direct employment tonight i ask employers large and small throughout the nation to use the help of the state and federal employment service whenever in the general pickup of business they require more workers tomorrow is labor day labor day in this country has never been a class holiday it has always been a national holiday it has never had more significance as a national holiday than it has now 
in other countries the relationship of employer and employee has been more or less been accepted as a class relationship not readily to be broken through in this country we insist as an essential of the american way of life that the employer employee relationship should be one between free men and equals we refuse to regard those who work with hand or brain as different from or inferior to those who live from their property we insist that labor is entitled to as much respect as property but our workers with hand and brain deserve more than respect for their labor they deserve practical protection in the opportunity to use their labor at a return adequate to support them at a decent and constantly rising standard of living and to accumulate a margin of security against the inevitable vicissitudes of life the average man must have that twofold opportunity if we are to avoid the growth of a class conscious society in this country there are those who fail to read both the signs of the times and american history they would try to refuse the worker any effective power to bargain collectively to earn a decent livelihood and to acquire security it is those short-sighted ones not labor who threaten this country with that class dissension which in other countries has led to dictatorship and the establishment of fear and hatred as the dominant emotions in human life all american workers brain workers and manual workers alike and all the rest of us whose well-being depends on theirs know that our needs are one in building an orderly economic democracy in which all can profit and in which all can be secure from the kind of faulty economic direction which brought us to the brink of common ruin seven years ago there is no cleavage between white-collar workers and manual workers between artists and artisans musicians and mechanics lawyers and accountants and architects and miners tomorrow labor day belongs to all of us tomorrow labor day symbolizes the hope of all americans anyone who calls it a class holiday challenges the whole concept of american democracy the fourth of july commemorates our political freedom a freedom which without economic freedom is meaningless indeed labor day symbolizes our determination to achieve an economic freedom for the average man which will give his political freedom reality End of section eight Section 9 of The Fireside Chats of Franklin Delano Roosevelt. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Fireside Chats of Franklin Delano Roosevelt by Franklin D. Roosevelt. Section 9. March 9, 1937. Part 1 last thursday i described in detail certain economic problems which everyone admits now face the nation for the many messages which have come to me after that speech and which it is physically impossible to answer individually i take this means of saying thank you tonight sitting at my desk in the white house i make my first radio report to the people in my second term of office i am reminded of that evening in march four years ago when i made my first radio report to you we were then in the midst of the great banking crisis soon after with the authority of the congress we asked the nation to turn over all of its privately held gold dollar for dollar to the government of the united states Today's recovery proves how right that policy was. But when, almost two years later, it came before the Supreme Court, its constitutionality was upheld only by a five-to-four vote. 
the change of one vote would have thrown all the affairs of this great nation back into hopeless chaos in effect four justices ruled that the right under a private contract to exact a pound of flesh was more sacred than the main objectives of the constitution to establish an enduring nation in nineteen thirty three you and i knew that we must never let our economic system get completely out of joint again that we could not afford to take the risk of another great depression we also became convinced that the only way to avoid a repetition of those dark days was to have a government with power to prevent and to cure the abuses and the inequalities which had thrown that system out of joint we then began a program of remedying those abuses and inequalities to give balance and stability to our economic system to make it bomb-proof against the causes of nineteen twenty nine today we are only part way through that program and recovery is speeding up to a point where the dangers of nineteen twenty nine are again becoming possible not this week or month perhaps but within a year or two national laws are needed to complete that program individual or local or state effort alone cannot protect us in nineteen thirty seven any better than ten years ago it will take time and plenty of time to work out our remedies administratively even after legislation is passed to complete our program of protection in time therefore we cannot delay one moment in making certain that our national government has power to carry through four years ago action did not come until the eleventh hour it was almost too late if we learned anything from the depression we will not allow ourselves to run around in new circles of futile discussion and debate always postponing the day of decision the american people have learned from the depression for in the last three national elections an overwhelming majority of them voted a mandate that the congress and the president begin the task of providing that protection not after long years of debate but now the courts however have cast doubts on the ability of the elected congress to protect us against catastrophe by meeting squarely our modern social and economic conditions we are at a crisis in our ability to proceed with that protection it is a quiet crisis there are no lines of depositors outside closed banks but to the far-sighted it is far-reaching in its possibilities of injury to america i want to talk with you very simply about the need for present action in this crisis the need to meet the unanswered challenge of one-third of a nation ill-nourished ill-clad ill-housed last thursday i described the american form of government as a three-horse team provided by the constitution to the american people so that their field might be ploughed the three horses are of course the three branches of government the congress the executive and the courts two of the horses are pulling in unison today the third is not those who have intimated that the president of the united states is trying to drive that team overlook the simple fact that the president as chief executive is himself one of the three horses it is the american people themselves who are in the driver's seat it is the american people themselves who want the furrow ploughed it is the american people themselves who expect the third horse to pull in unison with the other two 
i hope that you have re-read the constitution of the united states in these past few weeks like the bible it ought to be read again and again it is an easy document to understand when you remember that it was called into being because the articles of confederation under which the original thirteen states tried to operate after the revolution showed the need of a national government with power enough to handle national problems in its preamble the constitution states that it was intended to form a more perfect union and promote the general welfare and the powers given to the congress to carry out those purposes can be best described by saying that they were all the powers needed to meet each and every problem which then had a national character and which could not be met by merely local action but the framers went further having in mind that in succeeding generations many other problems then undreamed of would become national problems they gave to the congress the ample broad powers to levy taxes and provide for the common defense and general welfare of the united states that my friends is what i honestly believe to have been the clear and underlying purpose of the patriots who wrote a federal constitution to create a national government with national power intended as they said to form a more perfect union for ourselves and our posterity for nearly twenty years there was no conflict between the congress and the court then congress passed a statute which in eighteen o three the court said violated an express provision of the constitution the court claimed the power to declare it unconstitutional and did so declare it but a little later the court itself admitted that it was an extraordinary power to exercise and through mr justice washington laid down this limitation upon it it is but a decent respect due to the wisdom the integrity and the patriotism of the legislative body by which any law is passed to presume in favor of its validity until its violation of the constitution is proved beyond all reasonable doubt but since the rise of the modern movement for social and economic progress through legislation the court has more and more often and more and more boldly asserted a power to veto laws passed by the congress and state legislatures in complete disregard of this original limitation in the last four years the sound rule of giving statutes the benefit of all reasonable doubt has been cast aside the court has been acting not as a judicial body but as a policy-making body when the congress has sought to stabilize national agriculture to improve the conditions of labor to safeguard business against unfair competition to protect our national resources and in many other ways to serve our clearly national needs the majority of the court has been assuming the power to pass on the wisdom of these acts of the congress and to approve or disapprove the public policy written into these laws that is not only my accusation it is the accusation of most distinguished justices of the present supreme court i have not the time to quote to you all the language used by dissenting justices in many of these cases but in the case holding the railroad retirement act unconstitutional for instance chief justice hughes said in a dissenting opinion that the majority opinion was a departure from sound principles and placed an unwarranted limitation upon the commerce clause and three other justices agreed with him 
in the case of holding the aaa unconstitutional justice stone said of the majority opinion that it was a tortured construction of the constitution and two other justices agreed with him in the case holding the new york minimum wage law unconstitutional justice stone said that the majority were actually reading into the constitution their own personal economic predilections and that if the legislative power is not left free to choose the methods of solving the problems of poverty subsistence and health of large numbers in the community then government is to be rendered impotent and two other justices agreed with him in the face of these dissenting opinions there is no basis for the claim made by some members of the court that something in the constitution has compelled them regretfully to thwart the will of the people in the face of such dissenting opinions it is perfectly clear that as chief justice hughes has said we are under a constitution but the constitution is what the judges say it is the court in addition to the proper use of its judicial functions has improperly set itself up as a third house of the congress a super legislature as one of the justices has called it reading into the constitution words and implications which are not there and which were never intended to be there we have therefore reached the point as a nation where we must take action to save the constitution from the court and the court from itself we must find a way to take an appeal from the supreme court to the constitution itself we want a supreme court which will do justice under the constitution not over it in our courts we want a government of laws and not of men i want as all americans want an independent judiciary as proposed by the framers of the constitution that means a supreme court that will enforce the constitution as written that will refuse to amend the constitution by the arbitrary exercise of judicial power amended by judicial say so it does not mean a judiciary so independent that it can deny the existence of facts which are universally recognized how then could we proceed to perform the mandate given us it was said in last year's democratic platform if these problems cannot be effectively solved within the constitution we shall seek such clarifying amendments as will assure the power to enact those laws adequately to regulate commerce protect public health and safety and safeguard economic security in other words we said we would seek an amendment only if every other possible means by legislation were to fail when i commenced to review the situation with the problem squarely before me i came by a process of elimination to the conclusion that short of amendments the only method which was clearly constitutional and would at the same time carry out other much needed reforms was to infuse new blood into all our courts we must have men worthy and equipped to carry out impartial justice but at the same time we must have judges who will bring to the courts a present-day sense of the constitution judges who will retain in the courts the judicial functions of a court and reject the legislative powers which the courts have today assumed in forty-five out of the forty-eight states of the union judges are chosen not for life but for a period of years in many states judges must retire at the age of seventy congress has provided financial security 
by offering life pensions at full pay for federal judges on all courts who are willing to retire at seventy in the case of supreme court justices that pension is twenty thousand dollars a year but all federal judges once appointed can if they choose hold office for life no matter how old they may get to be end of section nine recording by linda johnson section ten of the fireside chats of franklin delano roosevelt this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. the fireside chats of franklin delano roosevelt by franklin d roosevelt section ten march nine nineteen thirty seven part two what is my proposal it is simply this whenever a judge or justice of any federal court has reached the age of seventy and does not avail himself of the opportunity to retire on a pension a new member shall be appointed by the president then in office with the approval as required by the constitution of the senate of the united states that plan has two chief purposes by bringing into the judicial system a steady and continuing stream of new and younger blood i hope first to make the administration of all federal justice speedier and therefore less costly secondly to bring to the decision of social and economic problems younger men who have had personal experience and contact with modern facts and circumstances under which average men have to live and work this plan will save our national constitution from hardening of the judicial arteries the number of judges to be appointed would depend wholly on the decision of present judges now over seventy or those who would subsequently reach the age of seventy if for instance any one of the six justices of the supreme court now over the age of seventy should retire as provided under the plan no additional place would be created consequently although there never can be more than fifteen there may be only fourteen or thirteen or twelve and there may be only nine there is nothing novel or radical about this idea it seeks to maintain the federal bench in full vigor it has been discussed and approved by many persons of high authority ever since a similar proposal passed the house of representatives in eighteen sixty nine why was the age fixed at seventy because the laws of many states the practice of the civil service the regulations of the army and navy and the rules of many of our universities and of almost every great private business enterprise commonly fix the retirement age at seventy years or less the statute would apply to all the courts in the federal system there is general approval so far as the lower federal courts are concerned the plan has met opposition only so far as the supreme court of the united states itself is concerned if such a plan is good for the lower courts it certainly ought to be equally good for the highest court from which there is no appeal those opposing this plan have sought to arouse prejudice and fear by crying that i am seeking to pack the supreme court and that a baneful precedent will be established what do they mean by the words packing the court let me answer this question with a bluntness that will end all honest misunderstanding of my purposes if by that phrase packing the court it is charged that i wish to place on the bench spineless puppets who would disregard the law and would decide specific cases as i wish them to be decided i make this answer that no president fit for his office would appoint 
and no senate of honorable men fit for their office would confirm that kind of appointees to the supreme court but if by that phrase the charge is made that i would appoint and the senate would confirm justices worthy to sit beside present members of the court who understand those modern conditions that i will appoint justices who will not undertake to override the judgment of the congress on legislative policy that i will appoint justices who will act as justices and not as legislators if the appointment of such justices can be called packing the courts then i say that i and with me the vast majority of the american people favor doing just that thing now is it a dangerous precedent for the congress to change the number of the justices the congress has always had and will have that power the number of justices has been changed several times before in the administration of john adams and thomas jefferson both signers of the declaration of independence andrew jackson abraham lincoln and ulysses s grant i suggest only the addition of justices to the bench in accordance with a clearly defined principle relating to a clearly defined age limit fundamentally if in the future america cannot trust the congress it elects to refrain from abuse of our constitutional usages democracy will have failed far beyond the importance to it of any kind of precedent concerning the judiciary we think it so much in the public interest to maintain a vigorous judiciary that we encourage the retirement of elderly judges by offering them a life pension at full salary why then should we leave the fulfillment of this public policy to chance or make independent on upon the desire or prejudice of any individual justice it is the clear intention of our public policy to provide for a constant flow of new and younger blood into the judiciary normally every president appoints a large number of district and circuit court judges and a few members of the supreme court until my first term practically every president of the united states has appointed at least one member of the supreme court president taft appointed five members and named a chief justice president wilson three president harding four including a chief justice president coolidge one president hoover three including a chief justice such a succession of appointments should have provided a court well balanced as to age but chance and the disinclination of individuals to leave the supreme bench have now given us a court in which five justices will be over seventy-five years of age before next june and one over seventy thus a sound public policy has been defeated i now propose that we establish by law an assurance against any such ill-balanced court in the future i propose that hereafter when a judge reaches the age of seventy a new and younger judge shall be added to the court automatically in this way i propose to enforce a sound public policy by law instead of leaving the composition of our federal courts including the highest to be determined by chance or the personal indecision of individuals if such a law as i propose is regarded as establishing a new precedent is it not a most desirable precedent like all lawyers like all americans i regret the necessity of this controversy but the welfare of the united states and indeed of the constitution itself is what we all must think about first 
our difficulty with the court today rises not from the court as an institution but from human beings within it but we cannot yield our constitutional destiny to the personal judgment of a few men who being fearful of the future would deny us the necessary means of dealing with the present this plan of mine is no attack on the court it seeks to restore the court to its rightful and historic place in our constitutional government and to have it resume its high task of building anew on the constitution a system of living law the court itself can best undo what the court has done i have thus explained to you the reasons that lie behind our efforts to secure results by legislation within the constitution i hope that thereby the difficult process of constitutional amendment may be rendered unnecessary but let us examine the process there are many types of amendment proposed each one is radically different from the other there is no substantial groups within the congress or outside it who are agreed on any single amendment it would take months or years to get substantial agreement upon the type and language of the amendment it would take months and years thereafter to get a two-thirds majority in favor of that amendment in both houses of the congress then would come the long course of ratification by three-fourths of all the states no amendment which any powerful economic interests or the leaders of any powerful political party have had reason to oppose has ever been ratified within anything like a reasonable time and thirteen states which contain only five per cent of the voting population can block ratification even though the thirty-five states with ninety-five per cent of the population are in favor of it a very large percentage of newspaper publishers chambers of commerce bar association manufacturers associations who are trying to give the impression that they really do want a constitutional amendment would be the first to exclaim as soon as an amendment was proposed oh i was for an amendment all right but this amendment you proposed is not the kind of amendment that i was thinking about i am therefore going to spend my time my efforts and my money to block the amendment although i would be awfully glad to help get some other kind of amendment ratified two groups oppose my plan on the ground that they favor a constitutional amendment the first includes those who fundamentally object to social and economic legislation along modern lines this is the same group who during the campaign last fall tried to block the mandate of the people now they are making a last stand and the strategy of that last stand is to suggest the time-consuming process of amendment in order to kill off by delay the legislation demanded by the mandate to them i say i do not think you will be able long to fool the american people as to your purposes the other groups is composed of those who honestly believe the amendment process is the best and who would be willing to support a reasonable amendment if they could agree on one to them i say we cannot rely on an amendment as the immediate or only answer to our present difficulties when the time comes for action you will find that many of those who pretend to support you will sabotage any constructive amendment which is proposed look at these strange bedfellows of yours when before have you found them really at your side in your fights for progress and remember one thing more even if an amendment were passed and even if in the years to come it were to be ratified its meaning would depend upon the kind of justices 
who would be sitting on the Supreme Court bench. An amendment, like the rest of the Constitution, is what the justices say it is, rather than what its framers or you might hope it is. This proposal of mine will not infringe in the slightest upon the civil or religious liberties so dear to every American. My record as governor and president proves my devotion to those liberties. You who know me can have no fear that I would tolerate the destruction by any branch of government of any part of our heritage of freedom. The present attempt by those opposed to progress to play upon the fears of danger to personal liberty brings again to mind that crude and cruel strategy tried by the same opposition to frighten the workers of America in a pay-envelope propaganda against the Social Security law. The workers were not fooled by that propaganda then. The people of America will not be fooled by such propaganda now. I am in favor of action through legislation. First, because I believe that it can be passed at this session of the Congress. Second, because it will provide a reinvigorated, liberal-minded judiciary necessary to furnish quicker and cheaper justice from bottom to top. Third, because it will provide a series of federal courts willing to enforce the Constitution as written and unwilling to assert legislative powers by writing into it their own political and economic policies. During the past half-century, the balance of power between the three great branches of the federal government has been tipped out of balance by the courts in direct contradiction of the high purposes of the framers of the Constitution. It is my purpose to restore that balance. You who know me will accept my solemn assurance that in a world in which democracy is under attack, I seek to make American democracy succeed. You and I will do our part. End of Section 10 Recording by Linda Johnson Section 11 of the Fireside Chats of Franklin Delano Roosevelt This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Fireside Chats of Franklin Delano Roosevelt by Franklin Delano Roosevelt October 12th 1937. My friends, this afternoon I have issued a proclamation calling a special session of the Congress to convene on Monday, November 15, 1937. I do this in order to give to the Congress an opportunity to consider important legislation before the regular session in January, and to enable the Congress to avoid a lengthy session next year extending through the summer. I know that many enemies of democracy will say that it is bad for business, bad for the tranquillity of the country, to have a special session, even one beginning only six weeks before the regular session. But I have never had sympathy with the point of view that a session of the Congress is an unfortunate intrusion of what they call politics into our national affairs. Those who do not like democracy want to keep legislators at home. But the Congress is an essential instrument of democratic government, and democratic government can never be considered an intruder into the affairs of a democratic nation. I shall ask this special session to consider immediately certain important legislation which my recent trip through the nation convinces me the American people immediately need. This does not mean that other legislation, to which I am not referring tonight, is not important for our national well-being, but other legislation can be more readily discussed at the regular session. Anyone charged with proposing or judging national policies should have first-hand knowledge of the nation as a whole. That is why, again this year, I have taken trips to all parts of the country. Last spring I visited the Southwest. This summer I made several trips in the East, 
now i am just back from a trip all the way across the continent and later this autumn i hope to pay my annual visit to the southeast for a president especially it is a duty to think in national terms he must think not only of this year but of future years when someone else will be president he must look beyond the average of prosperity and well-being of the country for averages easily cover up danger spots of poverty and instability he must not let the country be deceived by a merely temporary prosperity which depends on wasteful exploitation of resources which cannot last he must think not only of keeping us out of war today but also of keeping us out of war in generations to come the kind of prosperity we want is the sound and permanent kind which is not built up temporarily at the expense of any section or group and the kind of peace we want is the sound and permanent kind which is built on the cooperative search for peace by all the nations which want peace the other day i was asked to state my outstanding impression gained on this recent trip i said that it seemed to me to be the general understanding on the part of the average citizen of the broad objectives and policies which i have just outlined five years of fierce discussion and debate five years of information through the radio and the moving picture have taken the whole nation to school in the nation's business even those who have most attacked our objectives have by their very criticism encouraged the mass of our citizens to think about and understand the issues involved and understanding to approve out of that process we have learned to think as a nation and out of that process we have learned to feel ourselves a nation as never before in our history each section of america says to every other section thy people shall be my people for most of the country this has been a good year better in dollars and cents than for many years far better in the soundness of its prosperity and everywhere i went i found particular optimism about the good effect on business which is expected from the steady spending by farmers of the largest farm income in many years but we have not yet done all that must be done to make this prosperity stable the people of the united states were checked in their efforts to prevent future piling up of huge agricultural surpluses and the tumbling prices which inevitably follow them they were checked in their efforts to secure reasonable minimum wages and maximum hours and the end of child labor and because they were checked many groups in many parts of the country still have less purchasing power and a lower standard of living than the nation as a whole can permanently allow americans realize these facts that is why they ask government not to stop governing simply because prosperity has come back a long way they do not look upon government as an interloper in their affairs on the contrary they regard it as the most effective form of organized self-help sometimes i get bored sitting in washington hearing certain people talk and talk about all that government ought not do people who got all they wanted from government back in the days when the financial institutions and the railroads were being bailed out by government back in nineteen thirty three it is refreshing to go out through the country and feel the common wisdom that the time to repair the roof is when the sun is shining they want the financial budget balanced but they want the human budget balanced as well they want to set up a national economy which balances itself with as little government subsidy as possible for they realize that persistent subsidies ultimately bankrupt their government they are less concerned that every detail be immediately right than they are that the direction be right they know that just so long as we are traveling on the right road it does not make much difference if occasionally we hit a thank you marm the overwhelming majority of our citizens who live by agriculture are thinking very clearly how they want government to help them in connection with the production of crops they want government help in two ways first in the control of surpluses and second in the proper use of land the other day a reporter told me that he had never been able to understand why the government seeks to curtail crop production 
and at the same time to open up new irrigated acres. He was confusing two totally separate objectives. Crop surplus control relates to the total amount of any major crop grown in the whole nation on all cultivated land, good or bad. Control by the cooperation of the crop growers and with the help of the government. Land use, on the other hand, is a policy of providing each farmer with the best quality and type of land we have or can make available for his part in that total production. Adding good new land for diversified crops is offset by abandoning poor land now uneconomically farmed. The total amount of production largely determines the price of the crop, and therefore the difference between comfort and misery for the farmer. If we Americans were foolish enough to run every shoe factory 24 hours a day, seven days a week, we would soon have more shoes than the nation could possibly buy a surplus of shoes so great that it would have to be destroyed or given away or sold at prices far below the cost of the production. That simple law of supply and demand equally affects the price of all our major crops. You and I have heard big manufacturers talk about control of production by the farmer as an indefensible economy of scarcity. And yet these same manufacturers never hesitate to shut down their own huge plants, to throw men out of work, and cut down the purchasing power of whole communities whenever they think that they must adjust their production to an oversupply of the goods they make. When it is their baby who has the measles, they call it not an economy of scarcity, but sound business judgment. Of course, speaking seriously, what you and I want is such governmental rules of the game that labor and agriculture and industry will all produce a balanced abundance without waste. So we intend this winter to find a way to prevent four and a half cent cotton, nine cent corn, and thirty cent wheat, with all the disaster those prices mean for all of us, to prevent those prices from ever coming back again. To do that, the farmers themselves want to cooperate to build an all-weather farm program so that in the long run prices will be more stable. They believe this can be done, and the national budget kept out of the red. And when we have found that way to protect the farmers' prices from the effects of alternating crop surpluses and crop scarcities, we shall also have found a way to protect the nation's food supply from the effects of the same fluctuation— we ought always to have enough food at prices within the reach of the consuming public. For the consumers in the cities of America, we must find a way to help the farmers to store up in years of plenty enough to avoid hardship in the years of scarcity. Our land use policy is a different thing. I have just visited much of the work that the national government is doing to stop soil erosion, to save our forests, to prevent floods, to produce electric power for more general use, and to give people a chance to move from poor land onto better land by irrigating thousands of acres that need only water to provide an opportunity to make a good living. I saw bare and burned hillsides where only a few years ago great forests were growing. They are now being planted to young trees, not only to stop erosion, but to provide a lumber supply for the future. I saw CCC boys and WPA workers building check dams and small ponds and terraces to raise the water table and make it possible for farms and villages to remain in safety where they now are. I saw the harnessing of the turbulent Missouri, muddy with the topsoil of many states, and I saw barges on new channels carrying produce and freight athwart the nation. Let me give you two simple illustrations of why government projects of this type have a national importance for the whole country. In the Boise Valley in Idaho, I saw a district which had recently been irrigated to enormous fertility so that a family can now make a pretty good living from 40 acres of its land. Many of the families who are making good in that valley today moved there from a thousand miles away. They came from the dust strip that runs through the middle of the nation, all the way from the Canadian border to Mexico, a strip which includes large portions of ten states. That valley in western Idaho, therefore, assumes at once a national importance as a second chance for willing farmers. 
and year by year we propose to add more valleys to take care of thousands of other families who need the same kind of second chance in new green pastures the other illustration was at the grand Cooley dam in the state of washington the engineer in charge told me that almost half of the whole cost of that dam to date had been spent for materials that were manufactured east of the mississippi river giving employment and wages to thousands of industrial workers in the eastern third of the nation two thousand miles away all of this work needs of course a more business-like system of planning and greater foresight than we use today that is why i recommended to the last session of the congress the creation of seven planning regions in which local people will originate and coordinate recommendations as to the kind of this work to be done in their particular regions the congress will of course determine the projects to be selected within the budget limits to carry out any twentieth century program we must give the executive branch of the government twentieth century machinery to work with i recognize that democratic processes are necessarily and rightly slower than dictatorial processes but i refuse to believe that democratic processes need to be dangerously slow for many years we have all known that the executive and administrative departments of the government in washington are a higgledy-piggledy patchwork of duplicate responsibilities and overlapping powers the reorganization of this vast government machinery which i proposed to the congress last winter does not conflict with the principle of the democratic process as some people say it only makes that process work more efficiently on my recent trip many people have talked to me about the millions of men and women and children who still work at insufficient wages and over long hours american industry has searched the outside world to find new markets but it can create on its very doorstep the biggest and most permanent market it has ever had it needs the reduction of trade barriers to improve its foreign markets but it should not overlook the chance to reduce the domestic trade barrier right here right away without waiting for any treaty a few more dollars a week in wages a better distribution of jobs with a shorter working day will almost overnight make millions of our lowest paid workers actual buyers of billions of dollars of industrial and farm products that increased volume of sales ought to lessen other cost of production so much that even a considerable increase in labor costs can be absorbed without imposing higher prices on the consumer i am a firm believer in fully adequate pay for all labor but right now i am most greatly concerned in increasing the pay of the lowest paid labor those who are our most numerous consuming group but who today do not make enough to maintain a decent standard of living or to buy the food the clothes and the other articles necessary to keep our factories and our farms fully running far-sighted businessmen already understand and agree with this policy they agree also that no one section of the country can permanently benefit itself or the rest of the country by maintaining standards of wages and hours far inferior to other sections of the country most businessmen big and little know that their government neither wants to put them out of business nor to prevent them from earning a decent profit in spite of the alarms of a few who seek to regain control of american life most businessmen big and little know that their government is trying to make property more secure than ever by giving every family a real chance to have a property stake in the nation whatever danger there may be to the property and profits of the many if there be any danger comes not from government's attitude toward business but from restraints now imposed upon business by private monopolies and financial oligarchies the average businessman knows that a high cost of living is a great deterrent to business and that business prosperity depends much upon a low price policy which encourages the widest possible consumption as one of the country's leading economists recently said the continuance of business recovery in the united states depends far more upon business policies business pricing policies than it does on anything that may be done or not done in washington our competitive system is of course not altogether competitive 
Anybody who buys a large quantity of manufactured goods knows this, whether it be the government or an individual buyer. We have antitrust laws, to be sure, but they have not been adequate to check the growth of many monopolies. Whether or not they might have been adequate originally, interpretation by the courts and the difficulties and delays of legal procedure have now definitely limited their effectiveness. We are already studying how to strengthen our antitrust laws in order to end monopoly, not to hurt but to free legitimate businesses. I have touched briefly on these important subjects, which taken together make a program for the immediate future. To attain it, legislation is necessary. As we plan today for the creation of ever higher standards of living for the people of the United States, we are aware that our plans may be most seriously affected by events in the world outside our borders. By a series of trade agreements, we have been attempting to recreate the trade of the world which plays so important a part in our domestic prosperity. But we know that if the world outside our borders falls into the chaos of war, world trade will be completely disrupted. Nor can we view with indifference the destruction of civilized values throughout the world. We seek peace, not only for our generation, but also for the generation of our children. We seek for them the continuance of world civilization in order that their American civilization may continue to be invigorated by the achievements of civilized men and women in the rest of the world. I want our great democracy to be wise enough to realize that aloofness from war is not promoted by unawareness of war. In a world of mutual suspicions, peace must be affirmatively reached for. It cannot just be wished for, and it cannot just be waited for. We have now made known our willingness to attend a conference of the parties to the Nine Power Treaty of 1922, the Treaty of Washington, of which we are one of the original signatories. The purpose of this conference will be to seek, by agreement, a solution of the present situation in China. In efforts to find that solution, it is our purpose to cooperate with the other signatories to this treaty, including China and Japan. Such cooperation would be an example of one of the possible paths to follow in our search for means toward peace throughout the whole world. The development of civilization and human welfare is based on the acceptance by individuals of certain fundamental decencies in their relations with each other. The development of peace in the world is dependent, similarly, on the acceptance by nations of certain fundamental decencies in their relations with each other. Ultimately, I hope each nation will accept the fact that violations of these rules of conduct are an injury to the well-being of all nations. Meanwhile, remember that from 1913 to 1921, I personally was fairly close to world events, and in that period, while I learned much of what to do, I also learned much of what not to do. The common sense, the intelligence of America— agree with my statement that America hates war, America hopes for peace. Therefore, America actively engages in the search for peace. End of section 11. Recording by Maria Casper. Section 12 of the Fireside Chats of Franklin Delano Roosevelt. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Fireside Chats of Franklin Delano Roosevelt by Franklin Delano Roosevelt April 14, 1938, Part 1 My friends, five months have gone by since I last spoke to the people of the nation about the state of the nation. I had hoped to be able to defer this talk until next week, because, as we all know, this is Holy Week. But what I want to say to you, the people of the country, is of such immediate need and relates so closely to the lives of human beings and the prevention of human suffering that I have felt that there should be no delay. In this decision I have been strengthened by the thought that by speaking tonight there may be greater peace of mind 
and that the hope of easter may be more real at firesides everywhere and therefore that it is not inappropriate to encourage peace when so many of us are thinking of the prince of peace five years ago we faced a very serious problem of economic and social recovery for four and a half years that recovery proceeded apace it is only in the past seven months that it has received a visible setback and it is only within the past two months as we have waited patiently to see whether the forces of business itself would counteract it that it has become apparent that government itself can no longer safely fail to take aggressive government steps to meet it this recession has not returned us to the disasters and suffering of the beginning of nineteen thirty three your money in the bank is safe farmers are no longer in deep distress and have greater purchasing power dangers of security speculation have been minimized national income is almost fifty per cent higher than in nineteen thirty two and government has an established and accepted responsibility for relief but i know that many of you have lost your jobs or have seen your friends or members of your families lose their jobs and i do not propose that the government shall pretend not to see these things i know that the effect of our present difficulties has been uneven that they have affected some groups and some localities seriously but that they have been scarcely felt in others but i conceive the first duty of government is to protect the economic welfare of all the people in all sections and in all groups i said in my message opening the last session of congress that if private enterprise did not provide jobs this spring government would take up the slack that i would not let the people down we have all learned the lesson that government cannot afford to wait until it has lost the power to act therefore my friends i have sent a message of far-reaching importance to the congress i want to read to you tonight certain passages from that message and to talk with you about them in that message i analyzed the causes of the collapse of nineteen twenty nine in these words over-speculation in and over-production of practically every article or instrument used by man. Millions of people, to be sure, had been put to work, but the products of their hands had exceeded the purchasing power of their pocketbooks. Under the inexorable law of supply and demand, supply so overran demand which would pay that production was compelled to stop unemployment and closed factories resulted hence the tragic years from nineteen twenty nine to nineteen thirty three i pointed out to the congress that the national income not the government's income but the total of the income of all the individual citizens and families of the united states every farmer every worker every banker every professional man and every person who lived on income derived from investments that national income had amounted in the year nineteen twenty nine to eighty one billion dollars by nineteen thirty two this had fallen to thirty eight billion dollars gradually and up until a few months ago it had risen to a total an annual total of sixty eight billion dollars a pretty good comeback from the low point i then said this to the congress but the very vigor of the recovery in both durable goods and consumers goods brought into the picture early on certain highly undesirable practices which were in large part responsible for the economic decline which began in the later months of that year again production outran the ability to buy there were many reasons for this overproduction one of them was fear fear of war abroad fear of inflation fear of nationwide strikes none of these fears have been borne out production in many important lines of goods outran the ability of the public to purchase them for example through the winter and spring of nineteen thirty seven cotton factories in hundreds of cases were running on a three-shift basis piling up cotton goods in the factory and in the hands of middlemen and retailers 
for example also automobile manufacturers not only turned out a normal increase of finished cars but encouraged the normal increase to run into abnormal figures using every known method to push their sales this meant of course that the steel mills of the nation ran on a twenty-four hour basis and the tire companies and cotton factories and glass factories and others speeded up to meet the same type of abnormally stimulated demand the buying power of the nation lagged behind thus by the autumn of nineteen thirty seven last autumn the nation again had stocks on hand which the consuming public could not buy because the purchasing power of the consuming public had not kept pace with the production during the same period the prices of many vital products had risen faster than was warranted in the case of many commodities the price to the consumer was raised well above the inflationary boom prices of nineteen twenty nine in many lines of goods and materials prices got so high that buyers and builders ceased to buy or to build the economic process of getting out the raw materials putting them through the manufacturing and finishing processes selling them to the retailers selling them to the consumer and finally using them got completely out of balance the laying off of workers came upon us last autumn and has been continuing at such a pace ever since that all of us government and banking and business and workers and those faced with destitution recognize the need for action all of this i said to the congress to-day and i repeat it to you the people of the country to-night i went on to point out to the senate and the house of representatives that all the energies of government and business must be directed to increasing the national income to putting more people into private jobs to giving security and a feeling of security to all people in all walks of life i am constantly thinking of all our people unemployed and employed alike of their human problems of food and clothing and homes and education and health and old age you and i agree that security is our greatest need the chance to work the opportunity of making a reasonable profit in our business whether it be a very small business or a larger one the possibility of selling our farm products for enough money for our families to live on decently i know these are the things that decide the well-being of all our people therefore i am determined to do all in my power to help you attain that security and because i know that the people themselves have a deep conviction that secure prosperity of that kind cannot be a lasting one except on a basis of business fair dealing and a basis where all from the top to the bottom share in the prosperity i repeated to the congress to-day that neither it nor the chief executive can afford to weaken or destroy great reforms which during the past five years have been effected on behalf of the american people in our rehabilitation of the banking structure and of agriculture in our provisions for adequate and cheaper credit for all types of business in our acceptance of national responsibility for unemployment relief in our strengthening of the credit of state and local government in our encouragement of housing and slum clearance and home ownership in our supervision of stock exchanges and public utility holding companies and the issuance of new securities in our provision for social security the electorate of america wants no backward steps taken we have recognized the right of labor to free organization to collective bargaining and machinery for the handling of labor relations is now in existence the principles are established even though we can all admit that through the evolution of time administration and practices can be improved such improvement can come about most quickly and most peacefully through sincere efforts to understand and assist on the part of labor leaders and employers alike the never-ceasing evolution of human society will doubtless bring forth new problems which will require new adjustments 
our immediate task is to consolidate and maintain the gains achieved in this situation there is no reason and no occasion for any american to allow his fears to be aroused or his energy and enterprise to be paralyzed by doubt or uncertainty i came to the conclusion that the present-day problem calls for action both by the government and by the people that we suffer primarily from a failure of consumer demand because of lack of buying power therefore it is up to us to create an economic upturn how and where can and should the government help to start an upward spiral i went on in my message today to propose three groups of measures and i will summarize my recommendations first i asked for certain appropriations which are intended to keep the government expenditures for work relief and similar purposes during the coming fiscal year at the same rate of expenditure as at present this includes additional money for the works progress administration additional funds for the farm security administration additional allotments for the national youth administration and more money for the civilian conservation corps in order that it can maintain the existing number of camps now in operation these appropriations made necessary by increased unemployment will cost about a billion and a quarter dollars more than the estimates which i sent to congress on the third of january second i told the congress that the administration proposes to make additional bank reserves available for the credit needs of the country about one billion four hundred million dollars of gold now in the treasury will be used to pay these additional expenses of the government and three-quarters of a billion dollars of additional credit will be made available to the banks by reducing the reserves now required by the federal reserve board these two steps taking care of the relief needs and adding to bank credits are in our best judgment insufficient by themselves to start the nation on a sustained upward movement therefore i came to the third kind of government action which i consider to be vital i said to the congress you and i cannot afford to equip ourselves with two rounds of ammunition where three rounds are necessary if we stop at relief and credit we may find ourselves without ammunition before the enemy is routed if we are fully equipped with the third round of ammunition we stand to win the battle against adversity this third proposal is to make definite additions to the purchasing power of the nation by providing new work over and above the continuing of the old work first to enable the united states housing authority to undertake the immediate construction of about three hundred million dollars of additional slum clearance projects second to renew a public works program by starting as quickly as possible about one billion dollars worth of needed permanent public improvements in our states and their counties and cities third to add one hundred million dollars to the estimate for federal aid highways in excess of the amount i recommended in january fourth to add thirty seven million dollars over and above the former estimate of sixty three million for flood control and reclamation fifth to add twenty five million dollars additional for federal buildings in various parts of the country in recommending this program i am thinking not only of the immediate economic needs of the people of the nation but also of their personal liberties the most precious possession of all americans i am thinking of our democracy and of the recent trend in other parts of the world away from the democratic ideal democracy has disappeared in several other great nations disappeared not because the people of those nations disliked democracy but because they had grown tired of unemployment and insecurity of seeing their children hungry while they sat helpless in the face of government confusion and government weakness through lack of leadership in government finally in desperation they chose to sacrifice liberty in the hope of getting something to eat we in america know that our own democratic institutions can be preserved and made to work but in order to preserve them we need to act together to meet the problems of the nation boldly 
and to prove that the practical operation of democratic government is equal to the task of protecting the security of the people. End of section 12. Recording by Maria Casper.